most, um, probably worked most closely with the cases that we've actually prosecuted here in Wichita. Uh, he can tell you a lot about um, victims that we've had here in Wichita and cases that we've actually seen, kind of how that works. Um, one of the, the most important, most interesting things and things that has helped me most in work is, is hearing him talk about things that you could just be looking for, things that you might just notice, things that, um, that you kind of go, well, that doesn't seem right, and um, maybe I should do something about that. And not to advocate anybody jumping in and, and doing anything about it other than saying, here are the people we need to report this to. Here's who, here, you know, we, we go find the people who can actually do something about it. And Mark is one of those guys. So um, I will let you take it away. Thanks for having me tonight. <coughs> um, I'll, I'll tell you about some cases tonight a little bit. And this is obviously very formal, so if you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, I'd rather engage and talk than, than just stand here and lecture. Um, one thing, too, on the, the men's group, I've seen in the last few months um, some photos getting out of the, on the web and, and even some magazines where somebody's buying some ads with. Um, to Johnny Depp, maybe you know, these guys buy these shirts that don't men, real men don't buy women or buy girls and things. And you know, I'm not sure that one picture of Johnny Depp wearing a shirt like that is going to make a huge difference. But then again, it gets you thinking. And I, I don't know, I hadn't seen that out in the open that much. I mean, you think about where this, um, these kind of cases have come from and where they're, where it's headed. I mean, five years ago, the notion of human trafficking was I had some vague notion that this was going on in Thailand, um, and that maybe there were migrant workers being exploited. Uh, but the notion that there might be girls being sold, uh, and I knew there were women who were selling themselves for sex in Wichita, uh, and that's kind of how I compartmentalized it, but the notion that there were girls being sold um, here in this city, in, in, in this region, this part of the country, was something that I, I guess I probably knew intuitively existed, but I, I didn't want to think that it really happened as often as it does. Um, I will say, we hear statistics thrown around a bunch, of the truth is I don't know that we know how prevalent this is, but we do know this, it is happening. Uh, the raw numbers of cases that the EMCU is working and the number of cases we get in our criminal justice system tell us that it's happening here. Um, you know, whether we're in the top 10 or 20 or whatever, I don't know that there's any way to know that, but if it's happening at all, it's happening too much. So that's my little segue here. Um, in terms of the types of cases, what does human trafficking look like in, I'll say in reality, because not every, every case has its own reality, but in Wichita, what are we seeing? And rather than talk to you about abstracts and hypotheticals and, and it's like this, let me give you some real world examples. Now some of these are still um, cases that are pending. Uh, one problem we are having is getting these cases to trial. The guys, the penalties that they're facing are so profound. Um, we have one guy in particular on his fifth attorney. I mean, he just keeps firing them and because he, I guess it, would, it seems to me that um, he knows what he's up against. He knows how much time he's looking at. And he's trading water as fast as he can to, get, to do what he can to get out of the case. But um, So that's one downside of these cases. They are taking longer than I'd like to see to get through the system. But um, with that said, we have some that are in judgment, meaning they've been completed, they're convicted, it's something I can talk about. And a few that have been, there's been enough in the paper and had enough hearings that I can tell you about as well. So let me give you some real world, real world examples. <coughs> um, it can take several forms. One is girls being taken from which to somewhere else. One of our earliest and most successful cases was the case of uh, the defendant's name, Marlon Williams. Um, there was a young girl from, actually from Detroit, who came to Wichita with her mother. And um, mom had some addiction issues. She was staying with mom's sister, so the aunt to the child. Um, aunt had a partner, another woman, so the three women and then the child and mom. Um, the child, her mother was kind of a mess, uh, so she started running around a lot at night. And the aunt didn't like that because the aunt was pretty stable. She and her partner weren't having much of this. The girl ends up hooking up with an older man, and she gets pregnant. The man goes to prison for impregnating a, she was 13 at that time. Um, now there's a baby. 
So two women, one addict, a 14-year-old and a baby. Not a good mix, not a good combination. And the, the aunt, the two aunts, I guess, um, stepped in and said, you know, you're not being much of a mother to this baby. And I only heard her mention 15 and had very little uh, structure in her life. Probably wasn't the best mother. Um, so she did what a lot of teen girls, boys for that matter, do when faced with uh, an untenable situation. She took off uh, rather than, than face, and I don't say rather than deal with it or rather than face consequences, but just it was more than she was capable of at that time in her life, so she ran. The problem is she's now 14, 15, no skills, no education. Um, what does she have of value on the street to help her survive? Where is she going to stay? On the street that she's got one thing about it, her body. And the first time it happened, it was here in Wichita. She was staying with a, a woman, uh, I say one, a young, young gal, who said there's a guy who thinks she's cute and wants to have sex with you. Do it to give us a hundred bucks to pay for rent tonight. So the girl did. Um, it wasn't really anything, well, that's all the more it was. It just sounded like they almost stumbled into it. It wasn't like, I'm going to put a picture up on the internet, I'm going to you know, walk the streets. I mean, it's kind of nothing like it. It was just a, it was almost too stupid when you heard the story to be true. It just That's how it was. They just kind of bubbled into this thing. But that was her first foray and into that world. And like any illicit behavior, whether it's drugs or alcohol or stealing or whatever, the first one is always the hardest, but then it becomes easier after that to, well, I've already done it once, now, and then all the, you know, we're going to armchair analyze her, but then she begins to see herself, and like, this is what I am, this is what I've done, now that I've done it once, it just slippery slope, you know. So, she's at a party at the same house, um, and this one, I tell the story not just because it's one of the first cases of this interaction, this dialogue that I'm about to tell you about, was so so simple, it was almost chilling to me that this is all it took. This man pulls up, Williams, in a car, and she's out, and she's on the porch, she's outside, just kind of gathering a little bit of a party going on, and this girl walks up and says, Pressure wants to meet you, and that's the street name you my pressure. She walks up and she says, I knew what he was when I walked up. It had a, a pimp sign on the shirt or anything, but she said, You know what the guy is? We need a break. Okay? So, what's he say? What, how, I'm thinking, okay, so there's this grooming process, right? He, he probably said something and he bought her clothes and he, and he think of all the things you sort of stereotypically assume when he went on. He looks at him and says, Are you ready? Ready to step up to the game? That's all he said. By the way, if you have learn some of this uh, lingo, the game is the world of prostitution, that's what they call it, the game. Um, and she said, I thought, what else am I going to do? I'm staying here, essentially giving it away for rent. This guy seems to be professional, you know, what else was I going to do? So she said, okay. And he turned around and go back in the house to get more belongings. He said, you don't need it, just get in. She got in the car and drove and they pulled her away. And I thought, that was it. This was not a hour-long, day-long, minutes-long conversation. She got in the car with this guy, understanding what he was asking her in the span of a 20-second conversation. She gets in the car, she takes her to another location. There's another girl that they picked up. He takes her to you know, just a room. Um, says, take your clothes off, the two girls Strip. Um, she says, turn around, takes a look. Okay, get your clothes back on. Never laid a finger up. Never, you know, think, oh, he must have been raped or he beat it. No, he didn't touch her. She puts her clothes back on, they get in the car, and they head to Dallas. And they drive all the way from Wichita to Dallas. Uh, he and another guy, two girls in the back. And within a very short time of hitting the streets of Dallas, she's on the streets, walking the streets of Dallas for sex. Here's Here's, the, here's what you charge for straight sex, here's what you charge for oral sex, here's what you charge for this. Here's some condoms, don't come back until you got 500 bucks. Now, of course, she went. That was her training session. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you more about this case and how it resolved, but I think that's a good case study. It's not really, I don't see that as an anomaly or as some rare occasion. That is more typical of what happens than I think we would like to believe. It doesn't. 
not always some long grooming process. It's not always, uh, matter of fact, in my experience, the, the cases we've made, it's not accompanied by overt threats of violence or acts of violence. Um, really, at its root, it's, it's born of desperation. Girls who look at their situation go, what else am I going to do? Where else am I going to go? Uh, either sleep under a bridge or do this. You know. um, there's been a couple other cases um, I could talk to you about. You know, let me, while we're on the subject of this one, just so there's some resolution of this and you understand what could happen. She ended up in Dallas, uh, and to me, this is also very instructive for what the rest of us can do in terms of these cases. Um, she's walking the streets, and it's the high, high prostitution area of Dallas. One of the, as I understand it, one of the best known. Tracks uh, in the country. And again, that's one of the words, tracks. That if you're on the track, I mean, you're, that's where girls walk the streets. Um, and she's walking this area, high prostitution area, and there's a cop who it's his responsibility to drive that area. He looks over and sees this young girl and thinks, I'm out. Who are you? Number one, he knows most of the girls that walk the area. She's new, so she catches his eye. Number two, he looks at her over for a second, like, you are too young to be here. So he pulls over and says, you know, who are you? I'm Tina. Uh-huh. How old are you? 23. No, you're not. Try again. 22? No. And he, you know, they go back and forth for a while. And finally, she relents and says, I'm 15 from Wichita. Ah, okay. Um, I'll stop the story there for a second and just point out that every case that we've made, MCU has been able to identify a pimp, identify a John, get the girl safe. I mean, they save a lot more girls. Save is a, is a pretty dramatic word. They get a lot of these girls out of the situations a lot more than we can make cases because they may find her, they may see her, but if, they, if we can't identify the pimp fast enough, if we can't identify the John until a day or two later, it's really hard to get the John at that point because the girl doesn't know their names. They're not hiding. I, I didn't ask his name. There's not a lot of conversation. So they don't know, it's a, an Asian guy uh, at a hotel on the west side. Great, you know, we'll put out an all points bulletin for that guy, you know, I mean, give me a break. So, but that moment when he looked over and thought, who are you? You're too young. Now, does that mean all of us need to go around the streets tonight and looking for young girls and go, what are you doing? You know, no. But if you see something, um, and again, I, you know, I don't, the police force going, take it easy, Bennett, don't. I don't need a flood of calls here from everybody who sees a kid walking down the street, but, you know, there was not a lot of nuance to what was going on here. I mean, she's not in her brownie uniform. I mean, she's wearing stacked heels, and she was looking the part, and she was made to look the part, dressed up like a, a woman, not a girl that she was. She's in a high-trafficking area, um, and she's obviously very young. And you see something like that. You see, um, in one of the cases we had here in Wichita, a different case, and it was really, I think, the case that Jennifer first saw that galvanized her into being involved in this was a 13-year-old uh, from Wichita who was picked up by a guy in a, in a brand new Escalade. And, and, oh no, it's fine. I mean, what's wrong with driving an Escalade? Um, you know, but what's this guy who has no ties to her? She's standing outside of Quick Trip looking forlorn, um, looking lost, also, this guy pulls up and doesn't seem to know where they talk for a while, and she hops in the car with him. What's that about? Who is, is this her uncle? Who just, you know, it didn't take much to, to realize there's something else going on here. At least take a tag note. And if the cops go and do a suspicious character call and talk to him, they go, that is her uncle. Okay, we'll sign. Then no harm done. But what if it wasn't? What if there is something else going on? I can tell you two or three or four other cases in Wichita that were made simply because somebody saw something and went, eh, this is not right. Um, a case where, um, let me give you an example, there was a, a girl, and this is one that wasn't, that did not end up in, in, in as, as favorable as some of the others. This was a girl who uh, had an officer who was driving down Broadway. Actually, where we are here, over a block, and about three blocks south here, four blocks south here, 
Murdoch, that quick trip right there, at, just to, you know, murder Murdoch in, in Broadway. He was just north of there, over by the um, Taco Pico, in one of those areas, in one of those buildings there off Broadway. And there's some rel relatively cheap hotels, motels. Um, and he sees a girl standing in one of the doorways. And as he's driving by, he just looks over, catches her, and for half a second, he locks eyes with her and is like, okay, no, wrong. You are too young to be in a hotel, in that hotel by yourself. So he pulls in, knocks on the door, she answers it. Yeah, yeah. Um, how old are you? 24? No, you're not. How old are you? 23? No, you're not. And those, you know, again, doesn't take a lot. She, she admitted that she was, she was 15. Where are you from? Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. How'd you get here? This dude picked me up and brought me back. He traded me for somebody else. She <coughs> now, <coughs> so they pick her up, they say, by the way, how do you reach your family when you need them? Well, if you're hungry, I, I have this track phone. And, okay, how do you, you know, so they look and he's got his number in there, they call him, tell him you're hungry, I'm hungry. She walks over to Quick Chip to me and he shows up with a sandwich and the cops are resting. Now, here's the little catch for me. You know, in your mind's eye, how old is this guy? What's he look like? Let's see, you know, ask kid. Yeah, this is a pop quiz, but you think about it. What are your expectations? guy who has the wherewithal to come from Wichita, go all the way to Fulton County, Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, a major city, find his way to her and her handlers, trade something about it. She wasn't sure if it was another girl, she wasn't sure if it was money or dope or what, but something was, some exchange was made out of her presence, and she's told you go with him now. That guy, you know, in my, in my mind's eye, he's, he's pretty savvy. He's somebody who's at least worldly. Um, the reality is he's an 18-year-old kid from Wichita. I mean, that, that did not make sense in my worldview. Um, I never knew to this day, we don't know, how he found her. He wasn't talking. Um, we suspicioned that maybe gangs were involved, that there was one, you know, a kid with a crip, uh, he was a crip. Um, some connection, but he wasn't, he wasn't, it was some higher, you know, some guy deep into the crips either. He had some tangential gang connection. Maybe that wasn't even that. I don't know. But I know that he brought her back. Um, now the problem is when the case came to, to the preliminary hearing, she was back home. We, you know, she's, not a, she's not a Kansas girl. We can't keep her. So they sent her where she's from, back to her family. Um, problem is, she gets there, she's on the streets again. I got no witness. I'm playing, I'm bluffing all day long trying to Tell the defense I can find her. And I, oh, I find the defense attorney said, "Look, I know she's gone. I know she is." So I, how do you know? She's, you told me. The guy in jail in Sedgwick County knows she's on the run. Before I, so geez, I don't know. But obviously there's some connection. So anyway, we put it to uh, a lower level crime. I had no witness. I even spoke to the girl's mother down in Georgia. She said, "I haven't seen her in you know, X number of weeks. I hear the people have spotted her in, in downtown." My choice was to try to hold her and, you know, or dismiss the case here, go to refile if we could find her. I'd still be in the same boat. I had no way to get her, like, get her here for a day or two, and then she's on the run again. Um, that was not a good case. That was not one that I was, you know, pleased with the outcome. Back to Marlon Williams, the girl from Detroit who ends up in Dallas and by way of Wichita. When we brought her back, when she ends up back in Wichita, we charged the case. Um, and throughout the whole trial, Marlon kept whispering to they're putting me in prison for driving a girl in a car. The answer is yes. I mean, he never laid a finger on her in Kansas. He never touched her in Wichita. Um, now, when they got to Dallas, he uh, raped her a time or two, and I mean, there was sexual intercourse that took place down there. But he never laid a finger on her here. And so he was being prosecuted for driving her in a car from Wichita to Dallas. And he just he could not believe that. And the truth is, that's exactly what we prosecuted for trafficking, taking someone sexual purposes, with or without um, for, uh, force, uh, coercion, or fraud. It doesn't matter. Even if she went willingly. And in this case, there was she went willingly. It doesn't matter. She's 15. She can't. Um, so he was convicted of human trafficking and the judge sent him to the penitentiary. That was the first case that was charged, um, ever charged, let alone tried in Kansas under the new trafficking laws. And our Court of Appeals sustained the conviction, meaning they upheld it. Now it's on appeal, of course, to the Supreme Court. And we're 
we'll see if they uh, agree. I think that the Court of Appeals did a really nice job with their opinion. I'm hopeful that it'll be sustained because it's a lot's riding on that. A lot of these cases are riding on that. Um, because, you know, what do you do with the guy like Williams? They never really the bank robbery. There's no sex charge. Now, a lot of our cases, you get to John. I'm not charging John with trafficking. He didn't traffic anything. He didn't take anybody. He had sex with her on delivery, so he's charged with rape. But the pimps, uh, and if the pimps also touch the girls and, and mess with them sexually, then we can charge them with rape or with indecent liberties or whatever the case may be. Um, but for the guys who are just the, the couriers, um, and again, I, I agree with the, the notion that it's that you got to make a you got to curb demand. I think you got to curb demand. You got to curb supply. You got to curb the couriers. I mean, we got to attack all of the different areas. For a group like this. But anyway, that, that's one of the cases that, to me, spoke to the problem, the scope of the problem, and at least a way that you can combat it. What it took was someone who was paying attention. Um, you know, I, I, I was down in Dallas a couple of years, a couple of summers ago, at a big child uh, conference on, on child abuse. And you walk in the room, and there are, I think there were 4,700 social workers, prosecutors, cops, and people who were sexual and physical abuse. It was kind of awe-inspiring to be with that many people. It was, it was quite an event if you, if you get the chance to go, but um, it's also Dallas in August, so bring, bring your sunscreen. But um, anyway, there was, I went down there to give a presentation about it. It wasn't a trafficking case for a little girl here who was terribly abused. She uh, had heard of this one, her, her stepdad raped her for years and then poured survived. Uh, she's doing quite well. I saw her last week, in fact. She's, she's doing pretty good. But um, afterward, this woman, actually at the break, this woman walked up to me, and she was very, and as she talked, she got more and more choked up. But um, she said, you're from Wichita. I said, yes. And she said, I, I am a federal prosecutor in Little Rock, Arkansas. And when I heard you're from Wichita, I was moved to come see you. Wichita, I you know, like the song, you know, Glenn Campbell, what are we doing here? Man? She said, um, early 90s, she was working down there, and there was a guy, it was a, a couple in Wichita, who uh, worked around uh, fest, uh, fairs and festivals, I don't know what they call them, carnies, but they were, they were you know, working in that in the world. There was a truck driver, uh, one of the guys who moved their equipment around, who took a liking to their little girl. I want to say she was 10, I think the woman said. And these parents were, as she described, maybe a little low functioning and agreed to allow the little girl to go with the truck driver on his run from Wichita to, again, to Dallas. Because uh, she would be cool to ride in the big rig. You know, I'm thinking, how about Hayesville on my back, you know? But um, whatever, that's not very much me to judge. I make a lot of a very, very mad, horrible situation. But he drops his rig off in Dallas, or trailer and it takes off. He does not stay here, does not come back. He heads east into Texarkana, uh, crosses the line um, into Arkansas, which is where this woman is involved. And he pulls into a, I'll say quick trip, you know, a truck stop. And goes in to buy something. And the clerk behind the desk is working the midnight shift. And this guy walks in, she's never seen him before. And he Buys, he puts two bottles of Dr. Pepper on the counter and a roll of duct tape. And the hair on the back of her neck stood up. And she just, something wasn't right. And every overnight truck stop, who comes in, I mean, here's the most frequent stop. Cops a lot come to stop in for a cup of coffee in the middle of the night. And a highway patrolman was either there or came by minutes later and she said, and she knew and she said, I'm just begging you. I got his tag. Something's not right here. He's in a truck by himself. And he has two, and a roll of duct tape. And maybe he's got a rip in his seat. I'm sorry for bothering you, but something's not right. So that cop pulls him over, and lo and behold, the rig had been reported stolen because he didn't come back to Wichita the way he was supposed to. He felt he was off his route. So they turned him in. 
so now the cop has a reason to deal with it. But he finds that little girl in the back in the sleeper quarters. And she had been raped all the way from Wichita to Dallas, all the way from Dallas to, to Exeter Camp. And, you know, I don't know what he was going to do with the duct tape, but I guess my point is, I think if, if that woman had, I know another thing, if that woman in the truck stop had not made the call and not taken the step to say something, the world. I wish they wouldn't do that. It is dangerous, though. And if somebody doesn't make the call, and people don't realize that a few minutes alone in a car like that can kill somebody. Your core temperature goes from 98.6 to 102 or 3 or 4 or 5 or 6 in a very short amount of time, especially if your body is that big. You can't you know, emit enough heat out of your body fast enough in, in a cooker like that. You know, I'm getting off target here, but my point is people have to report those things. And not that you want to get I don't get them in trouble. The SRS take their kids. Yeah, but you want the kid to, you know. So I find myself, I mean, the other day I walked through the courthouse. And there was this little, little kid, probably two, three years old, standing there outside the bathrooms. And I walked by and I'm thinking, and I looked around, there, and there's nobody there. And a little girl. And I thought, okay, something's wrong. What's, what's going on? There's nobody there. So I stand there. And she looks at me and I look at her and she ain't talking to me and I'm just like keeping a nice healthy distance. I'm just standing there, you know? And about two minutes later, her dad walks out of the bathroom. He'd been in there, he couldn't take her in there with him. A single dad, I guess, you know. I'm thinking, okay, I kind of held it, but um, okay, whatever. You're safe now. And I went on about my business. It wasn't like I didn't call a social worker in to take his kid away. But my only point is, what if she just walk out the door? I mean, not that some guys would grab her, but just, you know. So anyway, uh, just being aware, being aware of your surroundings. Um, that's the message of I have. I can tell stories all night long about more human trafficking cases, um, but the stories, again, are all very similar. It's a girl in a tragic situation who finds herself, I say destitute, but finds herself with no options who gets taken advantage of by a guy who sees right through to her need, knows she needs shelter, needs, she needs clothing. Um, this isn't, these aren't girls who are making lots of money. Most of the time they're making zero money. But they're, they're paying the rent and they're getting clothes and they're getting food. And it's a way to at least care for themselves, take care of themselves. Um, there's a, one other point I want to make when I make, get these speeches, and that is, and this is a larger slower change to make, but um, first time I went up, I went and spoke at the, I think they call it the, the human slavery conference that they do in Topeka. Um, I mean, they moved that one over to Kansas City. I'm not sure if it's the same, same one, but about three or two, three years ago I did that. Senator Brownback was still a senator. Christy Childs is the, some of you know who Christy is, she's the, the caretaker, the, the director of Veronica's Voice in Kansas City. Um, and it was the first time I met Christy, and she said a few things that day that, that uh, you know, 
really change maybe even the way I thought I looked at these kind of cases. <coughs> um, a couple points. She said, you know, no woman wakes up at 30, 35, 28, whatever, and says, you know, working as a secretary just didn't get it done. I think I'd like to go sell myself for sex. I mean, that just, this, this Hollywood notion Thing you know, you're drinking yourself to sleep, you're smoking something, you're, you're inject ingesting something, you numb the reality of the environment you're in, and then it becomes harder and harder and harder to ever get out. Um, she says, you know, we treat these girls up until the age of 17 three, years of age and 364 days as victims, and the day they turn 18, they become perpetrators. They're whores. And she said, she was challenging people's perceptions and saying, that's not right. And I walked away from hearing her talk and thought, you know, I never thought of it that way. I just, I mean, first to admit, it didn't occur to me. Um, I wasn't thinking expansively enough, I guess, to recognize that, um, yes, they're breaking the law, but there's more to it than that. Um, you know, and then her final story was one that I think is worth repeating, and that is that Hers, hers, what got her out of it was a, a religious conversion. Um, and she said, uh, she remember laying in bed and, and looking up saying, you know, God, if this is what you put me here for, then take my life because this ain't what I want to be doing. Um, if this is all I'm worth, then just kill me now. And she was going to, I think, commit suicide. And then some different things occurred, and, and, and she had a, a religious conversion. And, and as she puts it, she um, prostituted herself to get out of prostitution. She Saving her money, quit doing drugs, continue to prostitute to earn enough money to get out of prostitution. So she prostituted herself out of prostitution, which is what that was the way she puts it. Um, it's a pretty remarkable story. And now she has devoted her life to getting other women out of that situation. So um, I don't know. I guess my, my point is twofold here tonight to give you an idea of things you can do to be plugged in um, and also just maybe change some perceptions about what this really is. I don't, know that you, I don't know what your perceptions were, but, I, but I, my guess is, unless you were a whole lot more uh, aware of things than I was when I started doing these cases, and I was, I've been a sex crime prosecutor for 10 years before uh, I did my first sex human trafficking case, so I, I thought I'd just, you know, I'd seen a few things, but I still didn't, you know, just didn't look at it quite the same way. So that's what these cases are like, that's what we're seeing here in Wichita, um, and that would be my message, I guess, to the group, um, anybody who wants to it's slow back to watch me on YouTube, so <laughs> but I appreciate your interest in the subject. Um, just be aware. Be aware of your surroundings. It may be a human trafficking case. It may be a domestic violence case. It may be, um, you know, you see, you go out to the bureaus on a party night and there's some girl who's had way too much to drink and there's somebody taking her out and you're not sure if the person walking around the door has her best fingers to fuck. Um, you know, I'm not saying we get in the middle of it. Somebody bitter smell. Um, there's any number of ways that you can make a difference in a life. If, if it's just one person, one time, spur of the moment, you get a chance to help. What's the old expression? You save one life, you save the world entire. It's, I guess there's a good reality in that. So. Any questions? Usually when I give these presentations, I just everybody's have they get tears in their eyes and want to go home. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, hi, um, my name is Steve, and I appreciate you coming here. I've met you all. This is a good time. And what is the success rate of rehabilitation? When you, and, and then is there an age differential with which success rate is it? Like at, at under 18, is the high success over 18 years? And can you talk about rehabilitation and the success rate? Sure. The question, in case you couldn't hear, is the, the air conditioner is a little hot, a little loud. What's the success rate, and is it maybe dependent on age? Um, I don't know, honestly. Um, we've had enough cases.
cases where we can start probably start to get some statistics. Uh, I can tell you that the girl, for instance, the one that ended up in Dallas, she's going to college now, last I heard at least. Um, and she's doing pretty well. There was a commonality there, though, or excuse me, commonality. There was something involved in her case that I think increased her likelihood of success, and that is two things, really. One, she was not using drugs. Um, I think when drugs are involved, it gets, there's one more thing you've got to overcome. Um, you read these cases nationally about the girls who get into it long term. The drugs are injected into the, the, the situation almost immediately. That's a way to control it's a way to get them addicted uh, so that they, I need you not just for a place to live, I need you to supply me with the dope that I'm addicted to now. Um, so her lack of, of use of narcotics, I think, helped her a lot. The other thing is, even though it had happened once in Wichita, and even though it had happened in Dallas, it had only been, I think it was her third or fourth day there. So big picture, she'd been doing this less than a week um, when that cop saw her event. Had she been in it months or weeks or even a year or more, I think every day is that much harder to get back up that slope. So if there's a if there's a factor that, that speaks to success, it's how quickly we can we get them out of the system, out of out of that environment. Um, probably more than anything else. So is there a rehabilitation component to the arrest and capture and identification of these days? <coughs> is there a psychological component tied into that rehabilitation? You're not gonna. I've learned to, to not to lower my expectations. I don't mean it that way, but to temper my expectations. These girls are not going to come to you with open arms to go. Thank you for saving me. I've been looking for for you and my white knight all these days. Now, a lot of times they're angry. Um, a lot of times they want to go back to that. And you think, how on earth could that be? Well, you know, if that's first of all, some of us have had independence. Um, if they're running to that, what are they running from? I mean, that, the, the home lives may have been even, in some ways, worse. And worse than getting to say I'm in social sex? Well, no, but bad. And, and, and so um, they're coming at this from a, a whole different situation. Um, but you know, what we try to do is get them into therapy. Um, social work gets involved. The sad truth is right now, a lot of these girls, the only place we can put them initially is jail. Uh, charging with prostitution, and then when they uh, have to have that time off the streets to kind of almost detox from that world, um, then we dismiss the case, and um, hopefully they're getting they're getting therapy while they're there too. There's that's one of the biggest problems that we're having is what to do in that intermediate intermediate stage between the street and reintroduction to you know, a, a more of a long term living situation. Those first few weeks are critical. And when you look at what's going on nationally, everybody's having the same problem. It's not like anybody's got this figured out. Um, it's a difficult scenario to deal with. To get, they're not just going to go back and join the cheerleading team a week after living on the streets. I mean, it's a difficult transition to get them out of that world. So. But therapy, you know, I'm not saying it secures everything, but I think it's, it's a vital Kansas Supreme Court, yes. Um, could you write the Supreme Court and encourage them to get the right thing? You sure could. Um, I can't promise you that it'll be any good. All right. There you, go. Um, you know, the truth is, I, I have some faith here that the Court of Appeals took a great deal of time to look at this. Um, they, they really did a nice job of researching the case they published. And now the Supreme Court would have to overrule uh, the legislative intent, which is pretty clear the legislature wanted this. One number two, so the Court of Appeals did a nice job of researching and coming up with a well-founded, uh, really a decision based on the law. So I'm hopeful that they'll they'll, come up, they'll reach the right conclusion. If they don't, all is not lost. We can always fix it again in the next legislative session. But um, I'd like to think that this is good good law because there's a lot of good.
I didn't call it right? and I wouldn't have even thought of it as a trafficking case. It was a, it was a, a, a mother who was selling her eight-year-old daughter to a guy down the street for sex uh, in exchange for cigarettes and whiskey. And uh, she'd sit on the bed and you know, pat her on the feet while this was happening and say, look, you're over with him. And we think it was almost too hard to believe that this could really happen. And yet the girl's two older siblings, two older sisters, uh, who were in their late teens, came in and said, she sold us to the same guy when we were her age. They were both convicted moms doing 25 to life, and the guy doing 50 to life. So, but yeah, that was, the first, that was the first time I had a case like that. But I guess, yeah, I said I was trapped. I didn't, that law didn't even exist at the time. Um, it was just a great case, just a great case. It was just a law case. above it when everything you've ever learned is that you can't, that you're not worth more than that. Well, and I so, have girls that are 18, 19, 20 years old that would give anything to hear <coughs> their mom say, I love you, and you know, that I'm proud of you, and they just, their parents, for whatever reason, aren't capable of that. And so that's where they get their such a their lack of sense of self-worth. Anybody else? As you probably know, uh, Jennifer's done a wonderful job at the social media mm -hmm. kind of thing. Is there any legislation that you know of that uh, is coming up or needs to come up that we could be involved in to, you know, send out and get passed that would help? Well, the, the um, just this past legislative session, uh, the Attorney General uh, asked, he's got human traffic. Human Trafficking Advisory Board, each tab. Um, we met a couple times, and we, uh, a couple of us, helped draft some legislation which he did um, tweet and, and submitted and was given a great reception. Uh, Steve Brown and some of the other legislators here locally, not trying to endorse it, but even they really did wrap their arms around this legislation and said that they wanted to do more to help. Um, made some changes effective, what, nine days ago, so today's the 10th of July, effective July 1, these, some of these changes went into effect. Some of the things we were trying to fix, I mean, the fact that um, soliciting a prostitute, uh, if she's an adult, was a Class C misdemeanor, which, just so you know, is, is it's unclassified, it's the same as, oh, like, right on a suspended license, you know, that's, what, that's how low some of these, these penalties were, and they were kind of bumped them 
them up. And also, they, there was a discussion about whether to decriminalize entirely um, prostitution for women, so we don't need that. But, you know, I'm not sure we're quite ready for that big old leap. But at the same time, they were trying to, to make sure that the laws, which had, some of them were fairly antiquated when it came to just prostitution top to bottom, that they were more in line with the we now, I think, are the way we're looking at these crimes. So, um, so that legislation went through. Um, and then the next big thing that we're trying to, we had to give up, one of our pushes was to get more space, therapeutic space for girls in SRS custody so they don't have to be charged um, and maybe make child maybe care cases. Or we were kicking out every option we could think of. That fight's going to come. That's a fight, but that um, legislation, that legislative push is probably going to come next year in the next legislative session. The idea was let's push through what we can get done today. And then let's come back because there was not unanimity among all the players. I mean, there was, and, and legitimately so. SRS had a different point of view than, than some of the judges who had a different point of view than some of the prosecutors. And we all thought, you know, let's not throw the baby out the back. Let's, let's do what we can. And then next year, let's continue to work on this. So I think over the next few years, there will be legislative tweaks. I mean, Justice Law is a good example. It came into effect in 2006. There have been, in each case that gets tried, more appeals. And as the appeals go through, um, mistakes are identified, the, the, um, there's a case called Horn that, that had to be we had to fix, the Horn fix, literally we called it, uh, where we fixed some of the, the problems in the law. I mean, no law, you can think, you can get everybody in the room, 100 legislators, 10 conferees, and we all get up there and talk, and you still aren't going to think about some collateral, unintended collateral consequence of the law. And so we'll keep working these things out over the next few years, trying to make sure that the law is as airtight as it can be. And then we'll see, there'll be a case where we go, I never thought that would happen. Okay, we need a new you know, legislation to, to fix that scenario. So, um, and as those come up, you know, being aware and staying informed with um, the legislative blogs and things like that to tell you what's going on, uh, is I think important because le legislators want to do the right thing. Sometimes it's just not on the radar. You know, they're worried about a farm bill or they're worried about something else. And so it's good to let your, your local legislator know what's important to you. So I'll, I'll be honest, I'll go ahead. This last round of legislation, um, <coughs> in uh, partnership with the circa, we put together a letter with some recommendations and um, sent that to people. So we have been involved in some of that and will continue to be as the new stuff comes up. Yeah, I, I found the legislators are receptive. I mean, they, when it comes to bed space impact, they don't want to, you know, do things that are going to cause lots more beds to have to be put into prisons. Um, so there's tax consequences. Ways that, but I think they want to do the right thing, especially when it comes to kids. I know they do. Anybody else? Um, are there any cases where um, the clientele is different and boys are the victims of human trafficking? We have, yeah, we have had, I can think of one, it's an anecdote, but we've had a case. Uh, he was uh, a young kid who, um, politely to say, he was cross dressing. Um, I don't think that the first kid who Encountered him on the street and knew that. Uh, and frankly, um, I was very concerned for as a victim, not just because of the life he, lifestyle he was in and how dangerous it was to get picked up. He was out on his own freelancing and, and getting picked up, but um, it's a very dangerous world for a young guy to you know, pull himself out as a girl and, and some guy gets older than not what he got more than he bargained for. It was violence. I mean, these, a lot of these young young boys who secure in their sexual orientation and they, they do this sort of thing, they get killed a lot. Uh, not locally, I can't, I can't say. I can give examples in Wichita, but I, I've read enough of other cases around the country where that's one of the most vulnerable populations within this vulnerable population. So we've only had one that I can think of, um, and he just desperately wanted to get out to California. To, um, he was convinced he was going to get out there and be a star or something. Thank you so much for your interest and uh, continue you know, your good work. And I, I 
told this story about Jennifer here. I'm not saying this to make her feel uncomfortable, but you know, it's it's in, somebody just getting galvanized about a story to read the paper just doesn't happen that often. But getting galvanized enough to, to start something like this and follow through with it, and a year and a half later you're still here doing it. Yeah, that's important. Um, um, you know, that's my husband. But you know, VAs come and go, police officers. City to make a long term lasting difference. So, okay. Well, thank you all very much. Have a good evening. Thank you.